Hey everybody, welcome back. I'm Seth Monahan, a guy who would never waste your time with stupid gags, and I'm here today to teach you all about aug I'm I'm here today to teach you Are you in there? Yeah, I'm just I'm doing a thing. What do you need? I got a letter here. I think it's from one of your viewers. Oh, bring it. Bring it, bring it, bring it. I love these things. Thank you. Okay, change of plans, folks. What? Come on, give me like two minutes. I have low self-esteem. This is good for me. Here we go. It says, Dear Dr. Monaghan, My, my name, name is Tammy. Tammy. I'm, I'm nine, nine years old. old. My one dream in life is to figure out Beethoven's Fifth Symphony by ear. I thought your videos could help me with this, but I can't even get through the first phrase. I know it's mostly just ones and fives, and I know it ends on a half cadence, but I can't figure out what the predominant is. I hear the bass going down by step into five, but four six doesn't seem right. And I can't even talk about how awful five four three of five sounds. You haven't given me any other options, and I feel betrayed. I guess it's time to give up on music and, and dreams, dreams too. Thanks, Thanks for, for nothing, nothing, Tammy. Tammy? <sighs> okay. Okay. Well, we're gonna use this as a learning opportunity, folks. This this Tammy person, she's obviously a little punk, but she was closer to the right answer than she thought. So let's start by putting Tammy's two guesses up on top and then compare them to Beethoven's actual predominant down below. Basically, it turns out that each of Tammy's guesses is half right. From 4-6 on the left, she got the bass A flat and the third above it. And from 5-7 of 5 on the right, really does sound terrible. She got the tritone F sharp to C. Put these together and you get Beethoven's chord. And this new predominant that you've made by combining chunks of harmonies we already know is called an augmented sixth chord. So let's learn what these are, what they do, and why they have such weird names. So augmented sixth chords are actually a family of chromatic predominance. They tend to come specifically before cadential dominance or cadential six fours, so we're going to be listening for them near the ends of phrases. In terms of just their raw sonic properties, they actually sound like root position 5-7 chords. If I play you Beethoven's predominant here out of context, it sounds like it probably wants to do this. But in context, it's a totally different story. Now it just sounds like a fairly crunchy predominant. Moving on. Augmented sixth chords may sound like 5-7 chords, but they are spelled differently, as we're going to see in a second. But before we talk about spelling, you need to know two things that set augmented sixth apart from pretty much any other chords you know. Number one, they don't have roots. And number two, they don't get inverted. Now let me clarify. When I say that augmented sixth chords don't have roots, I mean that they're not built as a stack of thirds above some fundamental identity-defining note. Put that whole idea aside for today. Instead, I want you to think about them as collections of scale degrees that are pretty much all tendency tones. They all want to move in a very particular way. And when I say that they don't get inverted, I lie, they do get inverted but so rarely that I'm not even going to talk about it. For our purposes, they are always built over one and only one bass note. So now let's talk about spelling. I called augmented sixth a family of chords because there are actually three types. But I'll start by showing what they all have in common, because there's a lot. First, all augmented sixth chords have lowered scale degree six in the bass. Since we're in C major here, that'll be A flat, and that bass note is going to go down by half step to scale degree 5. Next, 
All augmented sixth chords have raised scale degree four somewhere in an upper voice. Here that's F sharp, and it's gonna go up by semitone to scale degree five. Together, those two notes, lowered scale degree six and raised scale degree four, make the augmented sixth interval that the chord is named after. And they resolve that dissonant interval by wedging apart in contrary motion to make a consonant octave on the dominant note. And functionally, that motion is going to occur as a predominant gives way to a dominant. The last thing that's common to all augmented sixth chords is the tonic note, which is going to be also in some upper voice. And it is going to go down by step into the leading tone of the V chord. So all together, these three notes give us the essential sound of the augmented sixth chord and its resolution. But there's usually a fourth note as well, and it is going to be scale degree one, two, or lowered scale degree three. That's the only difference between the three types. And as you'll find out momentarily, these three variants all have dumb and totally arbitrary names inherited from various Western European countries. We begin with the so-called Italian augmented sixth. The fourth voice in this one is just another tonic note, which goes up to scale degree two when it resolves. Over to the right, we have the French augmented sixth, which puts scale degree two alongside scale degree one. And that extra note is just going to hang out there as a common tone when we go to five. And last, but not at all least, we have the so-called German augmented sixth, which has lowered scale degree three, making a perfect fifth above the bass. Now, this note definitely wants to go down by step into scale degree two when it resolves. But if we do that, we get parallel perfect fifths against the bass. And that is why all the theory textbooks will tell you that German augmented sixths quote unquote must go to a cadential 6-4 because it prevents those illegal parallels. The problem is, that's not true at all. German augmented sixths go directly to five all the time. Composers might just live with the parallel fifths, or more often, they'll find some sneaky way to make the offending note, that perfect fifth above the bass, just disappear right before the five chord arrives. Boom, no parallel fifths. So in honor of that little trick, which we're going to see a lot today, I'm going to set the E flat in gray to show that it has a tendency to vanish right before it gets into trouble. Okay, and lastly, you need to know that these chords are spelled exactly the same in major and minor. Though in major, you're obviously going to need more accidentals. If I drop a minor key signature in here, we're not going to need accidentals on the bass notes because A is already flat, and ditto the E flat in the German sixth. Now, what this means is that augmented sixth chords are a lot easier to see on the page in major keys because of all the accidentals they have. The problem is just that they're way more common in minor keys. And in minor, there's only one giveaway accidental, raised scale degree four. If you see raised scale degree four in minor with no other accidentals, check the bass. It's probably going to be on flat six, and you're probably dealing with an augmented sixth chord. Anyway, let's see this playing out in the examples that I have lined up. I want to start with a few pieces that are similar to Beethoven V in that they go directly from tonic to the augmented sixth chord. This is the slow movement from a Mozart piano concerto, and it starts with a four bar antecedent whose bass line could hardly be simpler. One, seven, one, six, five. And if you've been paying attention, you'll know right where the augmented sixth is gonna be. As predicted, the augmented sixth turns up right before the cadence. 
And I picked this example because you can really hear those outer voices wedging apart by half step. Other predominants don't do that. Think about poor Tammy and her chords. Both of them had bass notes that stepped down into five, but they didn't have that double half step motion. If Mozart had used four six here, the top voice would be moving by whole step. And if he had used an applied chord to five, the bottom voice would be moving by whole step. To my ears, neither of those two has the pull of the German sixth. At any rate, after the half cadence, the second phrase modulates to the relative major, but not immediately. There's a one bar idea in G minor that repeats with variation, and then our pivot chord, tonic in G minor, becomes a bridging six in B flat, and from there we slide gracefully into the cadence. Here is another Mozart concerto movement, and this one packs even more into eight bars. The first four bars are in C minor, and they use almost exactly the same progression as the last piece. And here too, we've got a German augmented sixth going straight to root position five. There's a risk of parallel fifths thanks to this E flat, so Mozart passes it from an inner voice into the melody, and then it's just gone. Poof, no parallel fifths. The second phrase starts in the relative major E flat with a pedal tone progression. But then Mozart does something sneaky. Look at the third beat of bar six. It appears to be a six six in E flat, but since that's not a thing, we need to look ahead to notice that the phrase actually ends in G minor. So that chord is probably better understood as 4-6 in that key. And watch what Mozart does. He takes that C minor triad with E flat in the bass and turns it into a German augmented sixth with the same bass note. And together they lead us directly into the cadential dominant of G minor. So looking back, it's clear that beat three of bar six was our breakaway chord, and the chord before it, our pivot. So here's the whole passage. Now we're going to hear a pair of examples in which the augmented sixth chord is approached by step from below. The first one is from a Haydn piano trio, and it shows that sometimes a deceptive sixth chord can be transformed into an augmented sixth with the addition of just a single note. The phrase starts out with all ones and fives, but the second five resolves deceptively to six. So there's the sixth being approached by step from below, from five. And then in the second half of the bar, Haydn adds a C sharp, which is raised scale degree four, to turn the submedian triad into a German augmented sixth, which then leads to the half cadence. Now, when I play you the entire phrase, I'm gonna throw in the next one as well, just to remind us of something we learned in video 34, which is that modulations sometimes happen in the cracks between phrases. We have a half cadence in G minor, and then immediately we're just in D minor with no overlap at all. Our next example shows an even more common situation. Here, 
Haydn approaches the augmented sixth from below by walking the bass up from another predominant. So the bass line itself will be scale degrees four, five, and then flat six, with five just being a passing tone or maybe a passing chord. And when the bass does this, we very often hear the top voice moving by step in the opposite direction through six, then five, then sharp four. So let's look at the music now. The passage itself is a slow sentence with a one bar basic idea, over tonic, which is then repeated over five. Haydn then brings back the tonic for a bar. And it's at the end of that bar that he approaches the augmented sixth chord with the four, five, six bass line. And again, you can really hear that contrary motion in the outer voices in the lead up to the cadence. Here's the whole thing. Now, we're not quite done with this one yet. I actually want to use Haydn's approach to the cadence here for a little mini workshop where we can learn to hear augmented sixth chords a little better by comparing them to other predominants whose bass notes step down into five. So here on the bottom, we have what Haydn wrote with an Italian augmented sixth. Then up on the left, we have plain old diatonic 4-6. And then on the right, we've got an applied chord, 7 diminished 6 of 5. Now, what do these three predominants have in common? They're all built from scale degrees 1, 4, and 6. But four and six exist in two versions here, a high version and a low version. So I'm going to use blue natural signs to show the low versions and yellow sharps to show the high versions. Now, the thing we want to notice first here is that both of the predominants on top use only one version. On the left, four six uses lowered scale degree six and natural scale degree four, notes that are just in the minor key already. And to my ears, relative to the other chords here, that predominant has what I'd call a soft, subdued sound. Now compare that very consonant predominant to the chord on the right, which has the raised versions of both four and six. To me, this chord has a very bright sound, thanks in part to the dissonant tritone it contains. So soft versus bright. Now, the Italian sixth chord is different in that it has the raised version of scale degree four, but the lowered version of scale degree six. This makes it the most dissonant of the three because we keep the tritone from the previous chord, but add the dissonance between F and D sharp now. And I get that this is starting to be a bit silly, but to my ears, this one has a kind of tangy sound. There's a real bite to it, but it doesn't have that bright, almost majorish sound of the applied chord. I'm going to cycle through each of these chords two more times, and I really want you to try to hear what I mean with these adjectives. Soft. Bright. Tangy, soft, bright, and tangy. Anyway, I hope that's helpful. Our last thing today is to look at some ways that augmented sixth chords can appear in lament bass lines. 
This, of course, takes us back to the topic of Lesson 28, and if you remember that video, you might be interested to know that augmented sixth chords are a really common substitute for 4-6 in lament basses. Only one note off. That makes it the penultimate chord, the one that leads right into 5, and this happens in both diatonic and chromatic laments. So, Let's start by visualizing the path that a lament bass takes when it walks down from 1 to 5. The total space is 5 semitones, but you may remember that the diatonic lament bass leaves out the raised versions of scale degrees 6 and 7, giving us this 4 chord progression. That's your entry-level, off-the-shelf lament bass. Well, as I just explained, we can ditch 4-6 and replace it with an augmented sixth chord, giving the approach to the dominant a, if you will, slightly tangier sound. Am I right? Can you taste it? So here is a theme where Haydn uses this exact progression. It's actually similar to our last example in that it's a slow sentence where the one-bar basic idea appears first over tonic, and then over dominant, and the second half is where we find the lament bass with the augmented sixth. Here is a real pianist playing it. So if you watched video 28, you might remember something I called the Cavalli archetype, which was a way of decorating the lament bass with a chain of suspensions. Well, with a one-note change, we can add a little extra flavor. I won't say what kind of flavor, but you know what I mean. Beethoven uses this exact progression in the main theme of the Coriolan Overture. It's a six-bar sentence, one plus one plus four, and the basic idea is just a single line. Repeat it exactly. And then on the third pass, that single line gets extended by a full bar and then expands into a full chordal texture for the lament bass with the augmented sixth. Here it is with an actual orchestra. It goes by fast. So now I want to look at a few chromatic lament bases. Another common substitution is to take out minor 5-6, that passing chord, and replace it with 5-4-2 of 4. When this happens, the next chord is very often built on raised scale degree 6, in which case it would be a major 4-6. And the reason that composers like this progression is that it gives them a rising chromatic line in the top voice, moving in contrary motion to the bass. With the chords, it sounds like this. And we hear it pretty much exactly like that in this D minor variation from a Mozart piano sonata. I'm going to ask you in advance to forgive me here because I can't play trills worth a damn, frankly. Uh, but we open with a full functional cycle using the standard 1-4-5 bass line. Never had a lesson. That's true. 
But then in the last bar and a half of the phrase, we find that chromatic lament we just looked at. Here are the notes of that chromatic wedge motion. Listen for them. Now, this is just the antecedent of a parallel period, and the consequent, it just so happens, uses an augmented sixth as well. It starts on 1-6, but then gets to a harmony we might not recognize at first. What's that chord there with what seems like sharp 1 in the melody? We've got F, A, C, and D sharp. Now, if you're quick on the draw, you might already have noticed that F up to D sharp is the interval of an augmented sixth. And it sure sounds like a 5-7 chord. So it's an augmented sixth chord, but it's not the augmented sixth that's native to D minor. We saw that up here with B flat in the bass and G sharp on top. So what key does this augmented sixth chord point to? Well, if F is lowered scale degree 6 and D sharp is raised scale degree 4, they're going to converge on an E, which is 5 of A minor. And we don't have to look far to see that's exactly where we're headed. And finally, if we're curious as to whether Mozart's key change uses a pivot chord, we have to go back just one chord to see that he does. The chord that starts the phrase sounds like 1-6 in D minor, but we could listen backwards to understand it as well as 4-6 in A minor. So here's what the whole thing sounds like at the proper tempo. So tangy. All right. Our last thing today is to dissect a fully chromatic lament bass, which is something we haven't done before. It's from Beethoven's third piano concerto, and we can build it using the Mozart progression we just studied. The last four chords are going to be exactly the same, but there are some important changes on the front end. To start, we need to plug in 565 over the raised version of scale degree 7. Then we're going to take out that tonic chord and open up an extra slot also on scale degree one. Now we plug tonic back in, but now it's a major tonic, so we're not really doing much lamenting here. And then finally, we plug in a predominant in the second slot, a 2-4-2, two, two, also from the major version of the key. So by this point, we've expanded our lament from four chords to seven and structured it around not one, but two full functional cycles. When I play the whole progression, notice how the chromatic descent in the bass gives the harmony a sense of forward momentum, of drive into that half cadence. Well, here is the actual score, and the thing we want to notice here is how Beethoven uses other musical parameters, motive, rhythm, phrase design, to amplify that sense of forward harmonic drive. The theme itself is built as a 13-bar sentence. There's a four-bar basic idea, which itself has two parts, a two-bar motive that arpeggiates upward and descends by step, and then a cascade of falling eighth notes. This basic idea then repeats with a change of harmony, and finally, there's a compressed five-bar continuation based just on that opening arpeggio of the basic idea. So in typical Beethovenian fashion, the motivic units of the continuation are shorter than the basic idea, giving the music a sense that it's building towards some finish. And he uses harmonic rhythm to the same effect. Notice how deliberately Beethoven speeds up the harmonic changes as the theme unfolds. The entire basic idea, a third of the excerpt, unfolds over a single chord, the tonic. Then the repeat of the basic idea moves through two chords, each held for two bars. Then 
Then the continuation cuts the harmonic rhythm in half again. We get 5 4 2 of 4 for two bars, but then the last two chords before the dominant, 4 6 and the German augmented sixth, for only one bar each. Here is the whole thing. So I may have lied a bit when I said that was the last thing, because I decided at the last minute that it was probably worth mentioning that augmented sixth chords occasionally go to 5-7 instead of 5. And when this happens, raised scale degree 4 won't go up like it normally does. Instead, it'll go down by half step to natural scale degree 4. So here, instead of going to G, the F sharp would fall to F natural. And instead of this, we now have this. And if we want to see this happen in real music, we can look at the middle movement of Beethoven's Appassionata Sonata. Its first phrase is a restrained little hymn with really no melody at all except for the bass flourish at the end. Then the second phrase starts with the same plagal motion. But the second half diverts to a German augmented sixth, bringing in a startling new harmonic color. So here is the augmented sixth chord, and here's how it sounds going directly to 5-7. But Beethoven tweaks this a little bit by having the top voice suspend scale degree one over the dominant. Notice as well that Beethoven actually spells the German augmented sixth wrong. Our bass note here is B double flat, that's flat six in D flat major, and in a German augmented sixth, we're supposed to have a note a perfect fifth above that, which would be F flat. That perfect fifth, in turn, creates the issue with parallel perfect fifths when we go directly to five. Well, Beethoven doesn't seem to want to have parallel fifths on the page, so he respells F flat as E natural instead. But he obviously also doesn't care that this still makes the sound of parallel fifths. So he's just using this dumb loophole to throw people like me off the scent. But it sounds absolutely fine, of course, as you'll hear when Richard Good plays it. And that's all I've got for you today, folks. But if you're curious about how the augmented sixth chords got their nationalities and why, then jump to the end of video 36, which deals with the one last geographical predominant, the so-called Neapolitan sixth. I'll see you then. Mm -hmm.